So yes, welcome. This week's event or this month's event is Life Under Lockdown, Roll Your Own ISP, How to Build a Scalable, Reliable ISP from Low Cost Components. I think what most of us will have lying around in the garage or somewhere else. <laughs> uh, we've got we've got oh, a few housekeeping things to mention. Since you're all in your own homes and in your own uh, uh, your own workplaces, wherever you happen to be, you should know where your exits are. So please look after yourselves, folks. Um, enjoy life outside, and uh, make sure you get there safely and, and look after yourselves. We will be sending out a feedback survey again after after tonight's event. So please look in your email or in any pop-up windows that happen after the Zoom windows close. It really does help us if you fill out these things because that way we know um, what, what ways to change this, how to improve things. I promise you we do always check the presentations and test the audio before we start. So any glitches and things that you hear along the way, we apologise for, we have tested for it, but any other encouragement to do so, we will always accept graciously. Um, the important things we need to hear apart from general improvements are future topics and if you or your organisation is available to do a preso for us, for the, the, um, the industry, for your peers, for other interested parties, we'd really like to hear, uh, hear the topics that you'd like to hear. Um, it, it could even be um, demonstrations of your own equipment, your own systems, your own networks and services. We're, we're happy to, to see that. I'm sure it'll be interesting and I'm sure it'll be fascinating to, to your peers. So please have a think about that and let us know. If you've got a preferred time slot with us, making sure that we're trying to make these things available for our, our, our colleagues in both the east of Australia and the west of Australia. And now we have a board member over in the, the, um, the US as well, and even to some of our friends in, in other parts of the world. Give, let us know what your preferred time slots are and we'll do our best to accommodate them. We want to be inclusive of our membership, as, as inclusive as we possibly can. So let us know. Or even if you want to have a peering social sometime where we simply just get up one after the other and say, hey, my ASN is this, connect with me or let me know, then we can even do that. But I, I want these suggestions to come from you folks. It's really important. Um, we, we'd like you to try and use the hashtag. Uh, so we're suggesting IAA LUL. Um, and you know, if it's life after lockdown next time, then perhaps we'll change it to that. <laughs> Uh, but this time, let's stick with IAA LUL. Uh, and another reminder too is that we have been doing lucky door prizes. So please stick around. And at the end of the event, we will be handing out some more of our great prizes. Okay, let us know. Upcoming, we're going to have a, uh, a end of year social, a Christmas drink social. That will be on Friday, the 11th of December, uh, starting so in the afternoon for you folks in Perth and starting early evening for, for those of us on the east coast of Australia. Um, we, I'm sure we will forgive our, our US friends for, for uh, drinking in the wee small hours. Um, it is not compulsory to drink, so you can bring your own favourite beverage of any particular variety to that, but we'd love to see you there. Uh, we're also having a roundtable soon with uh, the Minister's Advisor to talk about NBN issues. That will be a, um, a private uh, event. So if you are interested in it, please let us know. There will be no press. So it will be important that we have the right protocols in place if you want to attend that. The topic is on uh, onboarding, NBN onboarding for small ISPs, something which I know is uh, near and dear to the heart of our speaker tonight, who is, of course, Look at that segue, folks. I could work in radio. Um, Matt Enger. Matt is a business owner and current IAA board director, and he's doing a great job of that, I must say. He's got over 15 years' worth experience of small business telco and ISP work, starting his career in IT consulting and management. In 2005, Matt started his own business, X Integration, an ISP specialising in working directly with businesses to provide personalised solutions to their telecoms needs and expanded out in 2011 to his own retail ISP, LeapTel, which has now grown to 10,000 customers. We will hear more about Matt's journey starting up and growing his business in this preso tonight. Matt's also involved in the community, working with Scouts Victoria, he was recently promoted to State Commissioner of Scouts, where he leads the delivery of the Scouts section program throughout the state. So I, I'm constantly amazed by how much time Matt has got for uh, his community and his industry, as well as his job. And I'm sure we'll hear some more about that. Um, yeah, Matt 
Matt filled a casual position in 2018 on the IAA board and rejoined it this year as a professional member um, following, or rejoined it this year actually as, a, as an appointment to the board in January and then was elected recently uh, at the last AGM. And following the AGM, he was elected as secretary by the board of the association. So you'll be hearing a lot from Matt in the future, folks. <laughs> I'm going to ha now hang over to Matt, um, but a reminder to you that um, if you've got any questions throughout this preso, please place them into the chat box or into the Q&A and we'll be monitoring that and make sure that they're followed up with an answer. So I'm going to stop sharing now and hand over to Matt. Go for it, Matt. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming along. And I'll come and tell you some of the exciting things I've done and some of the mistakes I've made along the way, because this has certainly been quite a learning experience for me. Um, so um, thanks for the great introduction, Narelle. Um, yes, I am an owner of an ISP. I was that silly. I continued doing this and I keep trying to do it more. So um, yes, I'm self-taught with networking for ISP level stuff. So um, everything I'm sort of presenting today is some of the mistakes I've made along the way since I moved into the ISP space more seriously in 2011. And that's been quite a bit of fun. So we're going to cover some of the basic stuff and I'm going to relate it back to what's happened with me. So a bit about IP addressing, a bit about connectivity, which is of course going to talk about peering, which being at the IAA is very close to all of our heart. A um, bit about BGP and how I joined several uh, different states of IAA together at one point. A um, bit about network design and what I did and also landing NBN using L2TP PPPoE, which is what I've done at the moment. Um, and I'm gonna talk about DDoS and the fun experience I've had because the community internet is a nice place for everybody, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> so um, to give you where I came from, so in 2015 was running a small IT company. I've been buying layer three ADSL tails off Veritas who the two owners decided to have a fight. And one of them, I think one day went in and deleted all the um, configs off the routers and um, they sort of went down. So I moved over to um, ISP1, who I was actually on boarding with at the time. And then a little bit later, they went bust um, before Symbio took them over. And um, we basically at that point moved to another small guy who was doing um, layer three um, ADSL and NBN with AAPT. And um, after that, and my experience there, I started looking at doing it direct and realized, oh, my small number of 80 customers, I could afford to do this direct. So I decided to cut all the middlemen out and do this as layer two direct and had to learn a lot. So I had a VM cluster and I had some cash, not a lot. So this is basically a bit about my journey. And I'm also talking about what I would do now if I was doing it all over again. So first thing, I guess, if you're going to roll your own ISP is you need IP address space. Um, luckily in 2015, AP NIC was um, letting new providers have a slash 22 with the option for an additional slash 22. I think I've got that right. Uh, yes, it is. And uh, through the recycling scheme. So we got our first 2000 IP addresses through that scheme um, back in 2015 and probably about 2017, our second lot came through. Um, but nowadays, there's only a slash 23 allotment. So if you're starting this now, you don't get as, as large an allotment and you're going to have to either buy them, which can get quite expensive at over $20 an IP address, or you might be able to talk to your transit provider if you can do a deal with them and see if they can uh, lease you some space, um, which is not a bad way to get started. But we are going to look at CGNAT because if I was to put all of my customers on straight IP, I just couldn't do it. I can't afford it. And uh, thankfully, CGNet's kind of come a fair way since then. So you've got your IP space. Hopefully, you've also got an AS number from AP Nick while you were there. And uh, you're going to look at uh, connectivity. So um, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but yeah, there's so many providers out there, everything from the data centers, some of the major ones have got their own through to the various carriers are more than happy to sell it to you, to some of the small guys are even doing it and doing some really good deals. So um, shop around, uh, depending on your needs and see what you can get. Um, the other one to talk about is peering. Um, peering, as I will show you in just a minute, is extremely important. Um, it basically makes a small ISP viable, to be honest. Um, so yeah, you really do need it. And you really need to be seriously looking at doing it either in Victoria or New South Wales to start off with, because that's just where all the content is. 
Lastly, DDoS protection. We'll come back to this and I'll tell you the fun stories I've had with this one along the way. As I said, peering is your friend. So this was a snapshot I took of my network a couple of days ago. Um, basically looking at peak throughput on my network. Um, peak throughput 47.1% of my content was coming from IAA. Another 17% uh, was coming from Equinix IX, closely followed by Megaport and then Edge IX. Um, Google, which is the only content direct I have at the moment, was taking up 10%, 10% of traffic to Google. <laughs> and um, the rest of it was transit. So yes, transit is important. And even though IP address wise, 90% of the internet will be on transit because it's outside of Australia or not on peering, most of your content, 90% of your content is available on peering for a price of a port in a peering exchange. So you'd be stupid not to get some sort of peering in place from the start. DDoS protection. If you're gonna have residential customers, you are going to get attacked. I can remember a customer who was over in WA actually, and um, the, the account was in the wife's name and the wife kept getting phone calls from our customer support team going, your service is being attacked. Can you please do something about it? It's getting very annoying. Um, her husband was playing on his Xbox and was upsetting some of the people on there that every time his Xbox logged into the lobby, they would see his name and they would DDoS him just by turning the Xbox on. Um, it's just atrocious. Um, they just go onto the dark web, spend, I don't know, $20, organize a DDoS and down the packets come flooding out your connection. And uh, we were using Microtik gear, which means that when it can't route the packet, it responds back with an unreachable and the CPU goes to 100% and your network basically becomes unroutable. So DDoS is, protection is gonna be quite important to you and you need to find a solution that's gonna work for you. So I'll walk you through what I tried. And the first one was, oh yeah, the link floods out. I'll just put some SNMP monitoring on with my Zabbix monitoring system, detect the link maxing out, I'll log in quickly and I'll put in a rule to block the traffic. No problems. Well, this did quite work according to plan. I went to the cinema with my wife. During the movie, my watch starts vibrating, off comes an alarm. I quickly duck out of the cinema because of course being an IT nerd, I had my laptop with me on a date night. Hopped outside, was trying to tether my uh, mobile phone to my computer to get into the network. Oh dear, none of the major telcos on the mobile network appear. I'm trying to get through the same saturated link that um, my DDoS attacks coming through. Uh, my network fell apart at the time. Uh, and uh, yeah, I couldn't do much. Ended up that my brother who also worked for me had to come pick me up from the cinema so that Laura could continue watching the movie. Um, and I basically went home because my MBN circuit was of course on the back end and basically sorted it out. But uh, it was not the best date night I've ever had. <laughs> so after that, of course, I did what every IT engineer does hopped onto Google to try and find a solution that was within my budget, i.e. nothing. Hopped on, found a product called FastNetMon, which has got a nice little community edition, spun up a Linux VM, installed the software, pointed all the traffic flows from the various traffic coming into the edge of my network. So all my peering links, my transit links into FastNetMon. It detects the increase in traffic based on rules, packets per second, per total megabits going to a particular IP, whatever you decide to configure. And then it automatically pushed out a um, BGP community tagged route and told my upstream provider to block it. And within 60 seconds at most, the DDoS was blocked. My network kept going. All of a sudden I could go to the cinema again. <sighs> that worked really well. So yeah, it worked good. My Microtix also did max out. So it was always a bonus. The only problem was that um, it means that I block a single IP. And if you're doing CG NAT, that becomes a problem because you've got to have a single public IP with lots of customers behind it. So yeah, had to find a better solution as we rolled out CGNAT. So uh, yeah, we'll talk a bit about CGNAT since we're now here. Um, but the other side of CGNAT is also data retention. How are you gonna track which customer is using what traffic so that when the Mr. Plod comes at the door, you can actually tell him who it was. So first idea with CGNAT, 
which I will actually say another provider did do because they went bust and they happened to put their routers on eBay and I got them and had a look, is just enable the masquerade rule on the router and just let the traffic go, right? Well, that means you have to log every single packet in and out every time a TCP connection opens if you're a bit smart about the logging. And uh, Aussie Broadband did some looking at this and it was going to be 10 gig of log a day in 2019. And that's when they had 158,000 customers. Imagine now how many gig that would be with 600,000 plus. So this was only going to put money into the hard disk manufacturer's pocket. So I needed a better solution. Second one, which is actually nicely on the MicroTik wiki, is you basically allocate a port range. So we allocated uh, 500 ports per customer and uh, did, uh, which got us 120 customers per IP address. We rolled it out. Um, we have the radius server logging the internal IP address. So each customer is in a different state, has a different internal IP, um, which makes the logging really easy. And then we get a request from uh, uh, any um, police department, whoever it is, asking, uh, hey, can you tell us who this is? Or can you contact them because they're downloading illegal content? We can trace back the port that they connected from on the public side, find out internally and take the appropriate action. Um, so I've got a nice little spreadsheet and just standard radius. So this logs really, really well. So it does all of your data retention really nicely and easily. And realistically, it's not much more than what you probably would have been doing without CGNAT. So there's a link to it if you want to have a look at it. Um, there's a little script at the bottom which allows you to configure it. Um, there's only a little bug in it, which I still haven't fixed because I just manually fix it every time I do it. But there's a jump rule right at the end that the last one gets missed. So you have to go put it in yourself. Um, the only catch with this config on the MicroTik uh, is that um, it doesn't do anything but TCP UDP. So if you want to do ICMP, enable GRE or um, some other protocols, you might need to do something about that and figure out how you're going to log it. So I'll bring up the page just to show you. Right down at the bottom. Not that one. There it is. Just there. Okay, carrier grade CGNAT, or NAT444. So that's effectively the rules it puts in place. Um, and it does port ranges. And that's the script you run to actually do the configuration just by running that bottom command right there. Really easy, works really well. And yeah, we're running this everywhere now. And it's just great. <laughs> DDoS and CGNAT, however, going back to my 120 customers who all be attacked at the same time. Um, so one of them causes trouble, all 120 get blocked. Uh, two solutions. One of them is what I call funky CGNAT, which is probably just me being techie trying to make it sound cool. Um, the other one is um, upstream doing some sort of DDoS protection and scrubbing of the traffic. So what do I call funky CGNAT? Well, if you assign a number of IP addresses to your router that's doing the NAT and you distribute the customers across those IPs rather than doing the default config on a pool on a MicroTik, which basically um, fills up from the end backwards and comes forward, it means you actually distribute the customers across the IPs. So if a single IP gets attacked, unless you're maxing your pool out, that means that um, you're not gonna impact all 120 at a time. So we normally run this at around um, 50% or maybe a little bit more depending on how busy that particular pool is, but um, it allows us to distribute across, but it also means that if we lose um, a, um, basically an LNS, the cast, it can fall, fail over and still have the spare capacity in it. And it's quite a good balance. Um, so the config basically, instead of having just one pool under IP pool, is you create a whole lot of pools and each one just has 10 IP addresses. So you've got 8.1 to 8.10. And then you can see that the second pool, which it jumps to is going from 121 to 130. So that's actually the second public IP address. And I've got a little Perl script if anyone wants it that actually just generates all that config for me on the fly and um, just distributes them across and just works beautifully. DDoS protect, basically DDoS scrubbing. Um, really useful for CGNAC because hopefully as most traffic will be coming from a transit provider, i.e. compromised hosts overseas, 
um, yeah, it just scrubs it before it even hits your network. So 99% of the time, you won't even trigger a block on your network for the traffic because the upstream providers dealt with it and you just keep going. Um, works really, really well, especially if it triggers automatically. Um, but you still do need some protection running yourself. So as you can see there, that was a graph in Melbourne from the uh, was that 31st of the 10th. I oh, know it's the 10th, 10th of November, I think that was. Um, the upstream provider's DDoS protection didn't quite work and uh, maxed out our transit link in Victoria. So we were pushing five gig of traffic for a period of about 15 minutes. Painful. And we needed to block it on our side to stop the MicroTik routers crashing. Um, and so you do still need this combined with Fastnet Mon to make sure that your network's not going to come tumbling down. Um, peering is also great, but the problem with peering is that people like Amazon or Azure are running Windows boxes. Those Windows boxes get compromised. And at some point, you will actually get a DDoS attack over your peering port. And um, at the moment, all you can do is basically filter it out and block it and just wear it. It's not very common, but it does happen. So you do need to make sure you cover both angles for your DDoS attack. So I've covered some of the stuff you need to shop around and figure out before you start. Um, let's have a look at what hardware we're gonna build this out of. So I'm gonna talk about what I built it out of at the time. And if I was still doing this on a shoestring starting today, what I would actually be using now to get myself started. So um, I've got here three ports that I'm expecting to have. One is a 10G transit port. Another one is a peering port, which of course you've ordered from IAA. So Nick will be receiving your order in a couple of minutes, I hope. And the third one is your 10 gig port from your NVN provider doing your aggregation. So this is the configuration I've kind of came up with. So um, I've built this entire thing on MicroTik gear and I can make MicroTik gear do pretty much anything. Um, it's very cost effective um, and the, the MicroTik CCR 10 range, so 1072s and 1036s are great. Only reason I split this up onto two of them is because the cost is pretty low and it also means that if one starts playing up, I can still get in the other way and reboot something. So um, we've got the 1072, which has got 18 gig ports on it, which is gonna have three occupied with NBN, your peering and your um, link to upstream. And then I've put the 1036 with the transit. And it means if you have a DDoS come in, the transit router is probably gonna be the one that's gonna get impacted. You can uh, basically isolate it to that particular router and reboot it without impacting most of your customers later on. Switch wise, um, I'm assuming that you've got some sort of switch, although I'm gonna use a cloud core uh, cloud router switch. And I'm using some MicroTicks for the BNG or LNSs, um, which they do PPPoE really, really well. Um, yeah. And I've got a virtual couple of virtual machines running, which I'm not gonna go into how to configure because I'm pretty sure you guys will know how to do this, but I will talk a bit about some of the software reviews, which is just open source the Nick stuff. So what did I buy? Well, we're doing this for $8,000. So I bought a 1072, a 1036 um, to do the talking to transit, two CCR 1016s to do your, um, basically your LNSs, which you can run probably about three, 400 customers if you don't put fast forward on. If you put fast forward on, you can probably run that up to about 800, maybe more customers using PPPoE. Um, thing you start to worry about CPU load. So just need to keep an eye on it. A couple of DAC cables between the devices some fiber patch leads, and of course some 10 gig LR modules to connect up to your provider. So for $8,000, you've got the core equipment for your ISP up and going. Well, there's my rack when I started. I did say I was on a budget. I didn't afford or prioritize cable management. And I was very surprised that Nick ever let me touch one of his racks after he saw that photo, but he does. Um, so I'm obviously learning. Um, we had three 1016s at the very start doing um, our edge because uh, 1036s weren't quite an issue then. In fact, I started off with a one gig port, so it really didn't matter about 10 gig at the time. We had a 3750 Cisco switch um, that was lying around left over, so that did a great job. Um, we had two Cisco ASR 1001s that I had to buy, unfortunately. 
they were bloody expensive. Um, although $7,000 off eBay is not expensive back then, considering what it would cost to buy from Cisco Direct. But um, when I was on a really struggling budget, it was tight. But at that time, the Microtix could not do um, L2TP, uh, the VPN landing for the PPPoE sessions. So I had no choice. Um, so I bought some of those and I'm still running them, just about to pull them out of my network, but they still work really, really well. Um, yeah, so that one cost me about 18,000 to set up at the start versus the 8,000 that we could do it on now with Microtik gear from end to end. Radius, the major um, backbone of any ISP these days. Um, free Radius works really, really, really well. Um, MySQL database with some replication. Um, counting data, we had a written back to a central database, so we can actually pull it into our management system. And there are heaps of free tools out there to do ISP billing, or if you're stupid like me, go write your own and you're still writing it today. So both ways work. Little bit of a tip because I could not find this really well documented online for when I did it, because PPPoE or Microtix is exceptionally well documented, but as soon as you want to do the L2TP, it's kind of hidden away a bit because it was kind of a feature that was added later. So to give you a bit of an idea, point you in the right direction, I just landed the L2TP connection into a different VRF or route table on the um, Microtik. Make sure the MTU was set correctly to 1540 because you've got the PPPoE packet, which is 1500 Ethernet frame encapsulated inside the L2TP VPN. So you push the MTU up to 1540 to make sure that your customers get proper speed and actually do a ping test directly from your LNS or BNG right through to make sure that it's configured correctly because the number of times I've stuffed that up or the upstream provider stuffed that up because it's just <laughs> easy to miss, um, it's worth checking it. And there's the config that you need to um, basically configure the L2TP. So you assign the secret, um, make sure the VLAN set to 1540, and then you basically configure your L2TP server with that. So, and then if you've got PPPoE working and you've already tested it, it just comes up and just works. Um, New South Wales peering. Um, it's not as much of a problem as it is was back then, but it is uh, was certainly a problem back when I started. Um, a lot of content is based in New South Wales. So you connect to Victoria, um, it's getting better. Um, we've got, IA's got some great caches in Victoria and you will get a good chunk of your traffic, but you really do want to get onto a New South Wales peering exchange because you're going to push so much traffic through it because a lot of the big content providers are there. The, your Google, your Netflix, your Facebook, um, even a lot of your um, content providers like Fastly and um, Fast, I've forgotten the name now, Akamai are on a few of those as well. Um, it's really worth getting into New South Wales. So if you're serious about starting up from scratch, you might want to start in New South Wales, or if you are going to start in Victoria, talk to us at IAA about getting an extended reach port through to New South Wales because you could either that or you can pay the money to your transit provider and I can guarantee IA is a bit cheaper by a long way. BGP filters. Yeah, I really should have done a bit more research on this before I started. <laughs> I did say it was self-taught. I misconfigured the outbound filters on my BGP and my direct sessions to various content providers in New South Wales meant that for a good week, I think, I was um, backhauling traffic for several games through my network between Victoria and New South Wales. And for my one gig port, it was about 600 meg of extra traffic that I didn't need. Uh, but it was kind of fun to watch at the time and it was embarrassing, but um, yeah. Make sure you get your filters right, but thankfully we've got RPKI coming along now. So your route servers will be correctly filtering out the routes if you try and do this, but your direct peering sessions may or may not, depending on whether the content provider's doing it. So just, just be careful and pay attention to what you're doing and don't rush it. So you've got Victoria or you've got your first state operational and now you want to expand out to another state, or in our case, we expanded out to five. So what do you do? Well, really good. It's just a template you can sort of copy paste and actually figure it out. So just duplicating it over. So got Victoria down the bottom. I bought another 1072, another 1036, did similar peering um, arrangements. I did a direct transit into 
the other state, which is awesome, by the way, because um, at some point you will probably have a problem with the Telstra, oh, sorry, Telstra link. Focused it to me too. Um, transit link will go down. Um, at least you've got another one in another state. You can just route the traffic through the other way. So um, really useful having multiple transit links across multiple states. Um, you've got your intercapital link between the various routers, and you can do that a few different ways too. Um, and um, yeah, you just replicate this. Want to add another state? No problems. Just stick it on the side. Get another 1036, another 1072. Join them up. It's a really simple template to get yourself started in each state. And then from there, you can just add additional edge routers or additional LNSs as you need to. And being a good thing about Microsoft Gear is it's actually really, really cheap to do it with. Um, Intercapital, couple of options. Um, IAA has Intercapital available. Um, telcos can do it for you. Just make sure it's protected. Um, you don't really have the capacity at the moment to organise your own protection necessarily. So it's probably not worth having a having to worry about it, but still have a backup plan. Um, and I'll explain why. I had my intercapital running through another provider uh, who does certain ports that's coloured red and they had a script malfunction and it deleted my ports. So I lost my ports, I lost my intercapital, and I had connections to various um, internet providers <laughs> providing my internet customers with connectivity to me, all go down. We were down for about four to five hours, all because they had a script malfunction and decided to clean everything up. So make sure you have an alternative or a backup plan in place. So whether you get um, some, you might go to a large telco and get your direct link and then have another link through a third party or through something like IAA's got a direct um, VXC between different points, have a backup plan because at some point you're probably going to need it. So where did we go to from here? Well, we now got this running basically in five states now. So Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, WA and South Australia. We've got our own equipment basically copy paste, pasted this config and set up. Um, we're starting though to look beyond Microtik because we're starting to push the boundaries of 10 gig. Um, multiplexing 10 gig links works to a degree, but it's not really sustainable for the longer term. So we're looking at alternatives and I really want to deploy IPOE. Microtik haven't quite got IPOE working yet for me. So we're looking at alternatives. Um, anyone who's going, oh yeah, there's the CCR2004. I have one of them in my network. I'm just counting down till it randomly reboots on me. It does that about every 50 to 60 days. So I'm um, not convinced it's quite ready for production yet. And all it's doing is one uh, lot link to one other provider for traffic. So it's not doing anything very special and it's struggling. So I think the 2004 is not quite ready yet. What are we doing for our next generation? Well, that's the lab I've got sitting behind me at the moment because I'm still working on it. I'm still learning it. Um, I've got some Juniper MX5s, which have got 10 gig ports on them once you license them up. I've got a, a Rista there, which has got expanded RAM and able to take the full internet table. And I've got another one I've got on eBay, which is just keeping me going and playing with. And of course, a Microtik there, so that because I know it, so I can validate what I'm doing. Um, but that's where we're going next and probably we'll be moving away from Microtik just because we need to take it to the next level. But hopefully by this point, you might have a little bit of cash flow to be able to sustain it. And that is basically me. So any questions? Oh, I can see one question. Does NBN support MTU 1540 on different technologies? Not from my experience at the moment, they only support up to 1500, um, but I've only really been dealing with TC4 tails. Um, I haven't played with any of the TC2 or some of the enterprise stuff. So I can't really talk about it from that perspective, but for the basic residential or small business MBN TC4s, 1500s basically it. Uh, we've also got a hand raised from a Brett O'Hara. Let me just allow Brett to speak. There you go, Brett, you should be able to speak. Brett, ask a question. Gone shy. Brett, you might need to go off mute. You are on 
you're off mute. Brett, can you ask your question? Ah, you've gone on mute again. <laughs> Well, okay. Brett's sorting uh, out. Uh, how about I hold it down? I'll hold hold the space bar down. That's always the trick. That works. Go, Brett. I, I, I was going to put Will my you? hand straight back down again, but um, ask a question, uh, Brett. <laughs> no, 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 I was going to correct. Actually, the um, it, 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 uh, on um, on most most uh, TC four services, you can get up to two thousand bytes, and so we do uh, we we, ha we do offer a, a, a service where we encapsulate to get over the top of that. Um, but fixed wireless, I think, is is still very limited. Um, so yeah, just just uh, answering the MQ question. Oh, I'm looking awesome. forward to playing it because I'm currently going through the onboarding process with MBN, which I started in March and I am finally up to the point where they're letting me do a credit check now. So yeah. I might be able to tell you a bit more about that in a couple of years time. <laughs> um, also, also your, uh, your, your enterprise Ethernet services will go up to 9,016, I think. But yeah. Cool. Um, I have two questions that have come through on the Q&A. Uh, John's asked, do you have the Perl script that, for the CG NAT on Microtik? Yes, I do. Um, what I'll do is I will find a way to, I'm not sure if I type it. Let me see if I can paste it into that text box and um, <laughs> we'll go from there. Um, I believe Jason's got a question to ask. He's got his hand up. Yeah, hi. Um, awesome presentation. Um, we're, we're an IT company, similar story to you. We've got a lot of business clients that are on Fiber 1000s and we're looking to bring across our own um, services so that we don't, um, you know, we're not at the mercy of the recommended retail prices of our providers. So we got wholesale accounts and our account managers can't understand why we would pay for interconnects when they are giving those for free within all of their services. So a fiber 1000 is like 499 um, per month. Um, I'm just like, I'm just trying to, we're trying to work out whether we go and build this or like what's the break even point of your system is probably what the best question is. Yeah, so um, with so this is to do with um, well, Fiber 1000, that's an APT product. So this is where they sell you a layer two or a layer three service at the same price. Is that what you're talking about? Well, yeah, well, yeah, that's exactly the provider. So we've been, we've got over a hundred Fiber 1000 services. Okay. And we just want to now go and get the middleman out of it and <laughs> stop paying them. Yeah. Um, it's it's hard with the, the mixture for business. If you've got business NBN services and business, uh, so residential NBN services, the money is definitely there to be made if you've got a mixture because you actually get the fact that the CBC allotments or the bundles that come with the business services are hopefully not being used at night time to help you offset the peaks. You're not buying additional overage. Yeah, gotcha. um, So that definitely works out well. If you're just a business network, it is quite a bit harder to get that economy of scale because that's where we initially were. Um, and I I don't have a good answer as to where the break even point is, especially when you're dealing with a product like Fiber 1000, where they give you the layer three for the price of layer two, and there's no price saving to be made on that particular product. Yeah. And they even do that with the NBN EE product that they offer. Uh, it's the same price for layer two or layer three. So um, you kind of, I think, and what the, the approach I've been taking, because I've had a similar problem with uh, Telstra and they've got their wholesale broadband internet product, WBI, which is yeah. layer three, and they've got Telstra EA, which is effectively layer two, but they charge me more for layer two than they charge for the layer three product. Yet I want to be able to sell internet only at a layer two off my network. And I've more or less reached the conclusion that I've given up and I'm just going to sell layer three tails for those particular scenarios. And the customers who are going to go on a layer two are those who are wanting a private wide area network arrangement because they've got multi sites where I want to be able to control end to end very specifically, but they're also tending to be more willing to pay for that extra service. Um, because yeah, I've been fighting this battle with both Telstra and APT for several years and I've just given up because they don't listen. <laughs> so in your presentation, you focus on like running the ISP, like yep. the hardware component. But like that's the biggest problem that we've seen so far is the sales component in qualifying addresses and getting location IDs. Like mm -hmm. it's just a total mess. And we've got the AAPT API access 
and we've been firing off some sample addresses and basically every site's just coming back with just junk. You know, like how does Aussie Broadband and even yourself on your website just qualify a retail customer? What we do is the qualifier on our website was originally off APT. It's now off focus, um, but the change wasn't major. Um, do you what find do the database do? is better? No, they both query NBN, so it actually doesn't help either way. So what we've done is use, um, we're actually just about to change our website so that it uses an address database called Addressify. Um, which is about $4,000 a year, but it gives you a really good autocomplete address base because uh, we found with Google, there's a lot of addresses that are missing. Um, and then oh, we yeah. have some we have some scripts behind the scenes to do translations of things like drive to DR and stuff like that to do the mappings to get the address into the correct format so that we can then qualify it against um, NBN through APT or Vocus um, through their API. And uh, we found that works pretty well. The website qualification that you see on our website at the moment is, it does do a little bit of guessing. And for example, it won't qualify down to a unit number. It'll only qualify to the street address. Um, and sometimes when we get to the sales process, we actually do a bit more validation. So we take a little bit of a shortcut there, but um, that's going at adjusted address levels. So house 15, generally we can find most of them, but we still hit the occasional one where we can't, we just have to go and start the process with uh, NBN to get the address added. Okay. And then you've got your stack of radius service, but what are yep. you using as a professional services automation tool to drive the radius or services? PHP scripts that I wrote basically. So your entire back end is custom built for account management. Yeah, it is. And, and you part haven't of that found goes... any better platform that's out there that <laughs> nailed it? Uh, not that there's been able to do it to the level I've wanted. Um, the, the Back in my, before I did this, I worked and wrote the programming for a retail ISP called useoz.com when they were doing dial-up, 1895, or you can eat internet dial-up. And um, I wrote and learned all the radius and built tools to do all this. So I kind of had stuff already that I could extend because at that time, those tools didn't exist. So I, I basically extended that and took it further to do NBN um, at that point because that's where we were um, up to. So well, your secret source found... is going to be a valuable asset to your business. <laughs> it is. I can't deny that. Um, and then following on from that, have you, how do you go with supporting um, your pool of customers 24-7, uh, for example? Um, we don't, is the honest answer. So we have monitoring systems in place that monitor the core network and I get alarms and um, my staff get alarms and we go and deal with things. Our support hours are basically 9 a.m. Melbourne time till 9 p.m. during the week. And we make that very clear to the customers. And do we lose some customers because they can't call between nine and nine in the morning? Yes, we do probably lose a few, but the reality is it's so few customers that it hasn't really been a problem for us. But the other side of it is that the customers have been happy because they're talking to an Australian who actually understands what MBN is about. And we tend to resolve issues much more quickly because we're picking up the phone quickly. And so there's a trade-off. Um, okay. And then do you have a team of field technicians that then follow on and go out and install the equipment? Nope, we send our modems out in the mail or by courier with instructions and they literally just plug them in. MBN, and what the Chinese installed. modem have you purchased? Netcom. <laughs> and we tried you... Huawei, didn't like them. Um, we've tried Netcom has been the one we keep coming back to. Okay, and then have you white labeled it? No, but we've made a point that we don't white label it intentionally and we don't lock the firmware down because we get really annoyed when a customer calls up and goes, I've already got my old Telstra modem. Can I use this modem? And we're like, ah, good luck. We can't even log in and change that to do what we need to do. So um, we kind of make it a bit of a sales point that no, we don't lock the modem out. Okay. And then how are you handling bandwidth limitations at the end user as well? Like there's lots of people going around at the moment saying that they're able to hack their modem and push it to go faster and stuff like that, which I've yet to see in my real life. But have you ever had that scenario? <laughs> Haven't had that scenario. Um, the only scenarios that have been really problematic for us have been a customer who's decided that they're going to download the entire internet day after day after day. Um, there's a bit of a, a new customer comes onto your network, their internet usage tends to be really, really high because they really push the service. And then after a few days, it dies down. 
But when one of them decides to leak their Steam library and uh, download during peak at 100 megabits or 1,000 megabits if they're on 1,000 meg servers for a day or two, and then decide that, oh, no, they've installed it on the wrong petition, so they delete it and do it again, that mm. gets a bit frustrating. Um, and uh, generally, we've found that we approach these customers on the phone and say, hey, can you just leave it off for between 7 and 11 in the evening, and then after that, go for your life? And we've so been you're very hands-on, like you don't automate the emails that go out or anything saying, hey, you've violated our fair use policy? No, we've actually found that it's not a huge number of customers and by personally, the staff, one of our staff calling them, we've had a better response. Yeah, and, gotcha. Uh, yeah, I we found applied also. For our, we got our telco license yep. um, so that we could do it. What's the? What are you doing to ensure that you're keeping track? I know you spoke about your logging and stuff, but like... They made it like a big point in that, con like the telco agreement that you had to be able to service or like service to the police, all their traffic usage, you know, like that's seems like a lot of effort. Yes and no, because if you have a look at the data retention stuff, you're not allowed to give information regarding what the customer is browsing. So it, it does limit it down quite a bit. You don't have to provide that much detail. So we're logging where the customer's address is. We're logging what IP address they had at the time so that we can backtrack at connection if they provide us with the details. But we aren't logging what, traf what websites they're going to, what DNS queries they're making. And I've got a specific exception for that when I went to the data retention. I had to apply for it at the very start and tell them what we're doing and list what we're doing and they've approved it. So it's about making... Uh, when you go to register for the data retention, make sure you put in the correct exemptions. Yeah, okay. I've just stepped in here. I wanted to quickly remind you all that we are streaming live on Facebook and uh, we are recording this. So if you are going to discuss the specifics of your compliance with uh, various legal obligations, I just want to remind you all there that we are recording this and streaming live. So... <laughs> um, uh, Government I, I, signed I, off on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, I did, I did just mute you there, Jason. You were asking some really interesting questions. I might just jump over across now to Arash Nadrur again, because Arash has asked another interesting question in the Q&A, and that is how much traffic and percentage do you get over your uh, IX peerings compared to your transit? So I think I'll go back to the graph, actually. Go back to the graph if you want. That's uh, one of the first slides, isn't it? There it is. So basically 10% of traffic is off um, transit. The rest of it I got through peering. I think you might've been asking for what size bandwidth he was, you were talking about altogether so we can then do the maths. <laughs> <laughs> but there you go, folks. You mentioned some of the other ones along the way. Um, are there any other questions do we have here in the chat and so forth? We have a, a comment there on um, a regulator, which we won't go into. Uh, <laughs> I, I was, was going to also point there out that within that discussion you were having about address uh, validation and, and um, checking, I want to reinforce that. In the previous life, I was doing some IPMD stuff and we were validating addresses just for that because, I mean, you've got to force people to type in things that are valid to begin with, and then you've got to check that they are valid. And then once more after that, you've got to check again. It's, otherwise you waste too much, far too much time. Um, do we have any other questions in here? We're people talking about Radius and their favorite um, other tools, which I think we can all probably take as red. Uh, proxy Radius, Free Radius, um, just to wait. chime in a little bit on that radius thing to answer Jason's question, for a really, really, really cheap way to automatically provision your ISP users, there's a WHMCS free radius plugin that will provision any service in WHMCS within your radius server as soon as the service is approved and automated, approved and essentially invoiced, sold and paid for. Well, so if you're looking for a quick way to get started, you can always just do it with WHMCS and that little plugin. That's not yeah. Bliss Radius. Someone's talking about Bliss Radius. I'm not familiar with it. So someone has mentioned Bliss Radius there. Yeah, and I've played DNS wise, we've started off originally using Binds and then we went to using, I think it's Power DNS now and it's been running really, really well. 
what George has just oh. asked, what customer mass is required to break even when you start an ISP? Um, it's a good question, George. I would say you need to be aiming to get to about 5,000 customers before you actually start covering your costs. So you end up doing quite a bit of work uh, on your own time initially to get it all sorted. And then once you get to about 5,000, you've probably got enough money to pay for staff and uh, deal with calls. So it is, yes, it is a bit of a mountain <laughs> to climb. <laughs> but you started there, Matt, I think earlier on you said you had about 100 customers. Yeah, so... You, you, you we, break even on that. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, at 80 customers, I was able to break even just on the costs of how much it was going to cost me to get the NBN circuit and connect their service on. It didn't quite cover my rack costs and everything else, but it was enough to get me all started. Um, so at least I wasn't going to go further backwards buying the service. But, uh, yeah, you'd need a couple of thousand customers to really make it worthwhile. Yeah, so that's the bit about the point where the business pay case starts to look like you'll recover some money yeah. <laughs> and be able to afford those date nights, of course. Yes. So actually, I had a question which I think Jason kind of got instead of me there, which was around about NTUs and managing those, um, you know, the, the network termination units on the customer prem. You, so your, what's, your, what's your approach to that? What do you do? We don't manage them. So we send out the modem from our office. We actually got one of our staff who will go and pre-configure them. It takes them about five minutes, packages it all up and sends it out pre-configured and fingers crossed the customer will plug it in and it will just work. And 99 times out of 100 it does. And we have actually, Netcom's been really good for us because they've actually got a way on the back end to get into the router and uh, set up the defaults so that if someone factory resets it, it goes back to the config we've put into the router. So we've mm -hmm. actually, so um, yeah, most of our customers for the last 12 months, 18 months, we've been doing this setting for. So when they have trouble with their internet, we just get them to factory reset the router. It comes back to the config that we shipped out on it and um, gets them up and going again. So we don't have, um, we don't really have much problems with the routers in terms of having to go in and change anything after that. Oh, that is, that is really nifty. I really like the yep. sound of that. So do they have recent firmware? <laughs> do they regularly update the firmware on those? They I've do. Seen a... <laughs> they do actually update them specifically for most of the time VoIP issues. Um, we do have some older D-Link ones that have had some very nasty firmware issues where they, the CIP was getting hacked in them. And we did have to contact those customers and arrange manually to get the firmware upgraded. Um, but that was only a small number, thankfully. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, that sounds like pretty pretty smooth sailing then. Does anybody else yeah. have any other questions? Because I've got another question here too. Um, so we've got Mike O'Connor's made another comment here. I still support a 5,000 or so user base regional ISP using a TP link, which has been pre configured I'm not sure if that's a question or a comment. I think we'll have to do a Tony Jones on that one. Or we'll take that as a comment. Um, hey, Matt, can I chime in and ask, do you run any fiber halls yourself? No, we don't. And you've never applied for ducting or any rentals or anything like that? No, I haven't. So you could actually get more profit from your network if you were to look into building your own fiber backhaul? Yes, uh, except I have to do the fiber backhaul. It depends on where I'm going to run it to. Like if I'm going to build out to 121 poise, um, not going to be profitable, which is why um, Aussie Broadband's only starting to do it now. Um, if I was looking at just backhaul within the state, maybe between some of the data centres, potentially, where there's quite a large capital investment up the start. Plus, I need then a carrier licence and a few other things, which I don't currently have. So you can be an ISP operating at this level I am without a carrier licence, which has been really good. Yeah, and Jason, if I can speak from the perspective of having a carrier licence and owning some fibre, well, IAA does, the, it takes a lot longer to turn those, to turn fibre runs into a, um, an asset that is cash positive, you know, that, that is making you money as opposed to it having cost you a lot of money. You need to have a good fair chunk of capital up front in order to do that. But I assume you've actually started looking at those numbers by the sound of it. So yeah, we've got good. several big developments in the area where we're based and there's over 200 units in one building, for example, and you uh, know, if no. we can get fibre to that building and light it up. Yeah, yeah if, you can, 
if so you can do it, equations. Yep. yeah, if you can do it in such a way where you can lock out the um, NBN getting in there, it can work very effectively. And that's how your providers like Opticom and LBN Co and Red Train and all that have been getting in there. They lock out lock NBN out, so they've got no choice. Um, so if you could figure out how they do that and do it, absolutely can work really well for you. But yeah, and then like look at the likes of Utopia Fiber in the US where they've gone with this whole open wholesale model with their fiber network to then break the costs down. Mm. Yeah, it's all really exciting things. But of course, you've got to remember, you have to also then, if you're going to sell an NBN equivalent service, you've got to make sure that you comply with all of the NBN rules around those sorts of um, service delivery. Anyway, even know. <laughs> well, you have to <laughs> trust me. <laughs> so hang on, we've hit the magic six o'clock mark here. Um, what I'm going to do now is uh, ask Nick kindly to turn off the recording, to turn off the streaming. So we say bye-bye to everybody who's on the stream. Bye-bye all. Um, I will say thank you to Matt for his wonderful prezzo. And I think everybody should um, click on their emoticon that says big cheers. <laughs> uh, and I should point out to us all that it is time to go social. Ta -dum, ta -dum, ta -dum, ta -dum. While you're doing that, I'll answer these two oh. other questions that came in. <laughs> oh, there's more questions. <laughs> oh, there is. So John asked, what's the functionality on Netcom called where you can um, lock the factory default? It's a little secret that Netcom have. So if you have an account manager with Netcom and you ask them, they can give you the details. But there's a secret link you basically go to on the router to actually do it and save the functionality there. Yeah, please um, don't mention that while if Nick's, until we confirm from Nick that he's He has already that. confirmed he's for stopped. me. <laughs> Great. Um, and Adrian asked, what's your thoughts of the long-term viability of smaller ISPs? Um, I think it's a constant merry-go-round. If you're a small ISP and you come in to come in at the very low point, um, basically, so you're trying to offer an MBN service and undercut all the competition, good luck to you. Um, I don't see you guys lasting very long because the biggest problem I find with MBN is that everybody's demand for content and everything goes up, throughput goes up. So you'll eventually reach a point where the MBN CBC allotment hasn't actually got to the right amount to cover all the contents, you end up having to buy some overage. And if you're already really tight on margins, um, it's um, basically gonna really stuff you up. Whereas if you're uh, operating on a model where you actually have a little bit more margin, you've actually got some options there to at least absorb it until the NBN actually increases the allotment. So I think small at the bottom end of the price barrel is gonna be a problem. If you go for the middle and you concentrate on service and delivery and quality product, yes, you won't grow as fast, but I think you'll get a sustainable business which you can use to grow for the longer term. That's a great answer, Matt. Thank you for that. So, folks, we now need to switch over to our social time, which means we will um, once again, I think, say say thank you to Matt, but then we will we will. Um, so thank you so much, Matt, for making taking the time out to give us this presentation. It was fascinating, absolutely.